Hello everyone and welcome to another video here on the Kickabout Podcast channel. Now, today's one um, is going to kind of take the place of the lack of midweek digest videos I've been doing recently. I've just been kind of really busy, getting distracted by other things. I just haven't had a chance to create any. Um, and whilst I have said before that this is not an entirely West Ham channel, of course, being a West Ham fan, um, there's a lot of noise and a lot of distraction, you know, whatever you want to say about West Ham and in particular about David Moyes in the mainstream media or social media. And I want to address again and maybe go a little bit deeper than I did before as the reasons why. Now, if you're watching this video um, and you're one of those people that kind of can't understand why West Ham fans are so frustrated and you can't understand why we are seemingly wanting someone like David Moyes out when you look at the, the, the sort of table position and where we are in Europe and stuff like that. Um, when you're looking from the outside in, I can sort of get it, okay? I don't necessarily blame these people, but I, at the same time, I don't think that West Ham fans should be like ostracized, like abused and criticized for wanting more. And when I say more, I don't mean, which is what everyone seems to think we mean when we say this, when we, when we demand improvements, we don't think and we don't expect to suddenly go and start challenging for cups every every year. We don't expect to get into the Champions League, okay? West Ham fans are very well aware, or the majority of them are, are very well aware that our ceiling is probably fifth place. Absolute best, okay? More realistically, it's going to be in that probably sixth to ninth range, okay? As a, as a realistic viewpoint. Now, there'll be seasons where everything kind of clicks and you have a great season and perhaps maybe you do sneak into the Champions League like Aston Villa are currently experiencing, um, and the challenge will always be when you have those sorts of seasons, how do you kick on? How do you improve? How do you maintain that level? How do you get to the sort of consistently levels that you see Liverpool and City doing every year? Or, you know, trying to get to that point, I guess. So let's, you know, make sure that that is well aware. Before we go into this video, before I talk to you about some deeper statistical information, which helps illustrate the points as to why West Ham fans are frustrated, um, just keep that in mind, that, that that West Ham wanting more and potentially wanting Moyes to leave and have a, having a different approach, it is not because we suddenly feel like that we are this amazing team that should be challenging for everything. That is not what we're saying. What we're saying is, is that we would like to maintain the results, I guess, and maintain the league position, but play better football. And I don't necessarily understand why that's such a difficult thing for people to get their heads around because it's exactly what Newcastle are doing. It's exactly what Aston Villa are doing. It's exactly what Brighton have done in the last 18 months or so. I know they've tailed off a bit recently. It's what Leicester did for a few seasons before it all went pear-shaped. Okay, so... And in a world where we've got Manchester United are all, all over the place, Chelsea are all over the place, there's an opportunity to establish yourself as a top five club or a top six club. There is an opportunity there. And I feel like West Ham are wasting it at the moment. And I'll explain why. And you guys, at the end of this, with all this information, hopefully will have a better understanding of why West Ham fans are frustrated and be able to make a more informed decision as to whether you agree or disagree. And I don't really mind which of those two things you do, but I just want the information to be out there. I, I, I want this... Uh, I want un people to understand the truth behind why we are upset. So, very quickly, let's talk about last night as well. Bayern Leverkusen beat us 2-0 in the end. Um, I don't necessarily think that in isolation, if you took this game as in isolation, that a more conservative approach was the wrong thing to do. Um, I think we're a better team than that, and I think that we shouldn't have the inferiority complex that we do when we go against teams like Bayern Leverkusen or the better teams in the Premier League, um, because I think it nerfs us completely. And as proven by our defensive statistics this season, which we'll dive into in a moment, we are not that good defensively. Asking West Ham to do it for that long, or asking any team to do it for as long as Moyes does, you're asking for trouble. It's, it's the quality of opponent that you're coming up against week in, week out in the Premier League are going to take advantage of it. You are so, so, uh, seldom going to keep them out for 90 minutes every single week when you take that sort of approach. So last night... Bayern Leverkusen had more shots on goal than we had possession. They had 33 shots on goal. We had 27% possession. We had one shot. One. That was Kudus's in the first half, which in actual fact, he probably should have done better with because it was a very good opportunity. But I think that David Moyes, whilst again, I do believe that the conservative approach was probably a good idea, I don't think we should have been as conservative as, as we were. I think that we should have made sure that we were structured and well-disciplined defensively, but I feel like we could have been more expansive 
um, if he had wanted to be. Now, with the team that he lined up with when we had five defenders and two CDMs, that was never going to happen, right? It was not possible to be expansive with that sort of approach with the lineup. Um, but I do feel like we could have done more. I do feel like we could have perhaps played, uh, you know, thrown a curveball in there and, and maybe, you know, put in... I don't know, Danny Ings as a, as, a, as a focal point, maybe played Antonio out on the right or something like that and, and played uh, Kudas from the left or vice versa and just had them rotate a little bit. Danny Ings has shown at times, if you can get the ball in and around him, he's actually played pretty well. He's had a couple of good games in the second half of this calendar season against Sheffield United and, 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 and who was the home game against? I can't remember. But he had a really good game. And then he doesn't get a sniff. He doesn't get in the, in the team again. So... Uh, later on in this video as well, we are not only we're going to talk about the statistical information, but I'm also going to try and offer a balanced and fair appraisal of the situation at West Ham with David Moyes and the good things and the bad things. All right, so stick around, and I think you'll uh, you'll find something in this video that perhaps you didn't know, and it might just give you a different outlook and different viewpoint on the situation at our club at the moment. So let's talk about statistics. So I'm using a website called fbref.com um, and I'm going to talk to you very briefly about the statistics to do with uh, shots and possession and that sort of thing. They've got a whole host of statistical information on here. It's actually kind of mad how many stats they've got on here. It's a very, very good website. One I'm going to use again now that I found this earlier on today. Um, and I just want to, to highlight a few statistical information. So when we look at shots on goals, this is shots that West Ham are having on the goal every single game. And we're only going to focus on the Premier League here. European football is a different thing. We've had some good performances. We've had some bad performances. Um, but I'm going to focus on the Premier League um, because that's obviously the bread and butter. That is, you know, the, the it's, a, it's a bigger pool of data to pull from, which helps illustrate the points um, that I'm trying to make. So... We've had 375 shots on goal this season in the Premier League in the 32 games that we have played. Um, if you do the maths on that, that averages at 11.7 shots on goal per game, which actually isn't all that bad. Okay, given that we are a defensive time, a defensive team. Sorry, that's not all that bad. We've had a couple of games where we've gone into the uh, into the 20s. We've also had a number of games this season where we've been below 10. So it's it's peaks and troughs with that one. Shots on target, though, not quite so good. Again, I haven't looked at the overall statistics for every other team, so I don't know where this kind of stands. Um, we've only had 121 shots on target, so it's roughly a third of our shots on goal end up on target, which, on the face of it, doesn't seem all that bad. Um, but that averages out at 3.7 per game. Again, I haven't looked at the statistics around that to know where that sits. Um... But taking that number, the 3.75 average per game, that says to me, poor. Okay, that 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 on the face of it to me is a, is a, a number that I would expect to see in a team in the bottom third of the division. Now, we played 32 games this week, and I've already been through this. Uh, on 20, I think it's 22. I won't bother recounting it. It's either 21 or 22. On 21 or 22 different occasions this season, from the 32 games we have played, we have had less than five shots on target in a game. Only on 10 occasions have we gone above the five, and on no occasions this season have we ever had more than 10 shots on target. Again, I don't feel like many teams will go above 10 on a regular basis anyway. Um, obviously, maybe the very, very top teams may. But I would have expected a few games, you know, four or five games this season for us to pop off and get more than 10 shots on goal. Bearing in mind, we've had, for example, against Manchester United away when we lost 3-0. We had 22 shots on target. Uh, sorry, 22 shots on goal, just three on target. Against Sheffield United, we had 20 shots on goal, eight on target. That was a better performance. Burnley in the two-all draw at home, 22 shots on goal, just four on target. So the numbers don't make for great reading. There will always be anomalies in there, but they don't make for great reading. So just keep in mind them. So he said, what did I say? Three points, uh, let's just do the maths again, uh, divide by 32. So 3.7 on target, 11.75, I think it was 11.71 shots on goal. So now let's talk about the other end. Let's talk about how many shots on goal we are conceding, okay? So bearing in mind, we've had 375 shots on goal. We have conceded 521 shots on our goal. It's an average of 16.2 a game. That's quite high, isn't it? That's six to average 16 shots 
on our own goal is quite mad. That's, um, yeah, that's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> um, to put that into perspective as well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So on ten occasions this season, we've gone 20 or higher shots on our on our goal. Okay? Uh, and on three occasions, there have been times where the shots on target has gone into double figures. So shots on target is 179. 5.5 shots on target every single game. Um, yeah, pretty, pretty bad um, statistics against us. And this is because of the way David Moy sets up, because he sets up in that low block. You are going to invite more shots on your goal. So the statistics aren't all that surprising. But the problem is, is that when you've got a defence that has had players in and out of form, in and out of injuries, to ask them to consistently defend all the time is going to fail. It's it's not a long-term solution that's ever going to work. We have to have the ball at the other end of the pitch for longer periods to give them a breather, allow them to, to recover. Against Leverkusen last night, if it wasn't for Fabianski, that game would have been dead and buried. I know that they brought on two subs which changed the game and Moyes did nothing, really, other than damage limitation once we went 1-0 down, which ended up costing us another goal, or we conceded another goal after that sub was made. Um... If it wasn't for Fabianski, that game would have been dead and buried long before that. I know Leverkusen have got this incredible knack recently for scoring late, late goals. But it felt to me like it was so it was, it was justified. That result was justified. I mean, in, in reality, we should have lost that game by more. Comfortably. We offered nothing going forward at all other than the odd moment where Antonio would just do one of his Antonio runs and just bulldoze through people but ultimately he was on his own it was it was a big ask for someone to do that on his own he did some amazing work Pakatar and Kudus at times did some amazing work I thought Kudus was quiet last night by his own standards um, but ultimately you're asking them to do to three players against a swarm of Leverkusen defenders um, it just was never going to work so it's it, it is a problem when you consistently ask your, your team to face so many shots and just keep teams out because they never get a breather. There were times last night in that Leverkusen game where all 10 of their outfield players were within 25 yards of our goal. Even the commentator, the commentator, ugh, the commentators, sorry, and the pundits in the, uh, in the studio at half time by the pitch, even they were saying they've never seen anything like this. This is a quarter final of a Europa League game. How can you be this negative? It's, it's, it's baffling. And Leverkusen obviously knew that's why they pushed so high up. They weren't that bothered about the counter-attacking threat because they knew that West Ham would set up in such a way that even our own counter-attacking threat was going to be nullified because we just didn't have enough in the tank to do it. We were we had so many people deep that it was never going to catch us out. And their recovery runs were so good. They keep the ball for so long, they got so much energy left over. And by the end of the game, we were probably knackered. I said I was I was on a I was talking to a friend during the game and I said it to me, I would get fresh legs on here. You've asked this team to play at such a high intensity, closing down all the time and holding that shape, shifting from side to side as Bayern Leverkusen move the ball around. They're going to be fucked. Bring on some fresh legs. Get some other players on there just to make sure that they've got a, you know, fresh impetus, some more, you know, energy out there. And and, and he left it too late. Um, and his, his substitutions have been a real problem this year. And we'll get into some of those issues later. But that's... A snapshot of where we're looking there. Possession-wise stats, I mean, there's loads of other stats on this website you can go and look at if you want to help illustrate the point. Uh, but 41% possession is the average across the season. Um, I think I when I counted earlier that there was only seven times where we were higher than 50% possession. Only seven occasions out of 32 where we'd have more possession than the opponents. Uh, and again, in isolation, I don't mind having less possession than the bigger teams. I get it, okay? They're better teams than you. They're going to have more of the ball. But when you're cons giving up 25% possession, sorry, when you have 25% possession against Chelsea, 22 against Brighton, uh, 32 against Man City. These are numbers are very, very low, but again, in isolation, I don't mind. But then when you go down the, go down the league and you realise you've been dominated by Brentford, by uh, Wolves, by Fulham, Brighton on two occasions, by Sheffield United, by Bournemouth... With the greatest of respect to these teams, Everton as well. With the greatest respect to these teams, we should not be getting dominated possession-wise against these teams. Not with the team that we have. We're seventh in the league. People are telling us that we should be so, so happy. But then look at the games. I could go through this list right now and I could tell you that we were fortunate to win a lot of these games. 
some of the games you could say great defensive work, great counterattacking, job done, well done. But you, I don't know if you can ever realistically keep saying that because you're asking so much of our defence. You're asking, you're asking like Brighton. We beat them three one early in the season. If we remember back to that game, Ariola made four or five world class saves in that game that on another day fly in and and Brighton beat us comfortably. Um, so you're, you're always rolling the dice playing this style. When you take, when you give the opponents the ball for such long periods, you are rolling the dice and hoping that they don't do anything with it. When you've got players like Kudas, Pakatar, Bowen, Antonio, Alvarez, you know, can can be quite dynamic when he when he's in the mood. Um, at that point, we still have players like Ben Rama and Four Nows. Give them more opportunities to influence games. Pakatar is not a player that wants to play without the ball. He wants the ball at his feet. Everyone says how amazing he is. Well, think how amazing he would be if he played in a team that played possession-based football. If he goes to Man City in the summer, which by all accounts is looking quite likely, you watch him shine there. You watch how good he'll be or straight off the bat. I guarantee you he'll be class for Guardiola. I really, I really do think that. So anyway, that's a look at the statistical side of things. Again, you can go and look for yourself if you want some further corroborating evidence to illustrate the points we're making. But West Ham are too defensive. We give up too many shots on our goal and it costs us a lot. Um, and I, I know hindsight is a wonderful thing and that we have won some games that we probably deserve to lose. Um, but we've also been beaten heavily this season. We've lost 4-1 to Villa, 5-0 to Fulham, 6-0 to Arsenal. Um, we conceded three ridiculously late goals against Newcastle and conceded four there. Um, it's, you know, we, we, <laughs> there's just something that doesn't sit right when you watch this because there's an element of it's Groundhog Day. You turn up to a game, you turn up to a stadium, you know what's going to happen. You know how your team is going to play. And if you as fans know that, the performance analytics standards that we see today in the Premier League of the staff and coaches and teams that you're coming up against, they will know. They will know exactly how West Ham are going to play. And because David Moyes has made the least number of substitutions this season and changed his starting eleven the least number of times, they know not only your tactics, but your, your starting lineup before you've even named it. And this stubborn nature, this refusal to rotate, to change things, to be different, is what is causing the large bulk of this frustration because when he has let the team off the leash the 4-2 win against Brentford the 5-0 win against Freiburg we've looked absolutely outstanding but he only ever seems to do that when his job feels like it's on the line Solskjaer did this for Man United a few years ago every time it looked like he was one or two losses away from losing his job he'd come up with a result he'd come up with a performance he knows how to do it. He's shown he is capable of being able to do it but he refuses to he goes back to the same low block counter-stacking, low-intensity game. And look, <laughs> you, you, you may well be sitting there right now thinking, yeah, but you're winning games. You're seventh in the league. I get that. But I don't believe in my heart of hearts. When you look at the games we've drawn against Palace, we've drawn against Sheffield United, Bournemouth, we've drawn against Burnley, we've drawn against um, Spurs at home in, in recent times and, and playing the same way. Draw against, I think we've drawn against Bournemouth twice. We have. I refuse to believe with the team that we have, if we played a more positive brand, that we could not have beaten those teams. We might have lost. We might have drawn. But there are ways to do it. And, and, and f I'm sorry, in today's world, the amount of money that it costs to go to football, I think there is a... I think it's... I, I genuinely do think this, and you, I might get slaughtered for this, but I do think that this whole saying about it being a results business is bollocks. I really do. I think that football fans nowadays, with the amount of money that it costs, would far rather be entertained every single week than have similar levels of uh, success playing this style. If you gave any club in this league a choice and said, right, you guys are going to be seventh in the league. You are going to play a low block, counter-attacking style. You're going to have very little of the ball. Every team that you play against is going to come at you, no matter how good or bad they are, but you're going to win probably more than you, you, you'll lose and you'll have a modicum of success. Maybe pick up a third-rate European trophy along the way. And I'm not saying that to discount the trophy because it was a brilliant achievement. It's a fantastic evening for West Ham United, one that will go down in history for our club. But look at the quality of teams that were in there and realise that we should have done better. Okay, It's the same argument everyone uses for when England got to the, um, the semi-final of the World Cup and the final of the Euros. They will always say, yeah, it's a brilliant achievement, but look who we played. It's the same thing for West Ham. You can't turn around and use the fact that West Ham won a trophy as a reason that Moyes says, and then when and sorry, you can't use that. Let me st <laughs> let me start that again. 
you can't use the conference league title as a as a, a weapon as a as a point in your argument to say that Moy should stay because he's given us this trophy and then when West Ham fans make a song and dance about the fact that we won a European trophy, we're European champions, I know it's all very tongue in cheek, and then turn around and say to us no but it's a third rate trophy, you should have won it no one cares about that trophy you can't have it both ways, you can't you can't tell us that because he's won a trophy he deserves to stay and then at the same time say it's a shit trophy to win, it's bollocks you can't do both ways so yeah, back to the point. I, I do think that we can play a different style. We can, If you offered teams a choice between what I just said about 7th place playing shit football, etc, etc, and then said, look, you can still be 7th, but you're going to play a, a much att more attacking brand of football, but you obviously, you're rolling the dice every week because you open yourselves up and against better teams you might get thumped. I, hand on heart, believe that 99% of fans would choose that. Ask Spurs fans right now. They've had... A good season. With Harry Kane gone, this was a, this was a really pivotal season to how they would recover. And just come in, and he's given them a brand of football to be excited about. Yeah, they had Mourinho, they had Nuno, they had Conte before. They all played a dire brand of football, not too dissimilar to what Moyes does, and they fucking hated it. Manchester United fans hated it under Solskjaer when they were playing counter-attacking football. They hated it under, under Ranić, and for a good chunk of this season, they have not enjoyed watching Man United play under Ten Hag. And I know they're Manchester United and all the history that goes around it, but the argument and the points and the, the underlying criticisms and statistical information are saying the exact same fucking thing about those teams as they are about David Moyes and West Ham. It's just that if Manchester United recover because of the resources they have, their ceiling is higher because they've got more resources to spend. They're, they, they're a much more attractive club for a player to go to because of the history associated with them. But that doesn't change the fact that they want a better brand of football to play because they're fucking bored. They're tired of watching all that crap football and West Ham are wanting the same thing. It's just that May United ceiling is probably up there if they can recover, you know, and get back to how they used to be and West Ham ceiling is probably about here. So it's the same thing, just the ceiling is different. It's the same thing. So it's it's very, very frustrating and I'm getting more and more agitated the more I make this video. Um, but it just winds me up when I see talk sport making such a, a staunch defense of David Moyes. It is like he is the Messiah. It is like he is the only manager that can manage West Ham United. It is like he is so good that we are somehow blind to his genius, you know? And it's I've only seen two pundits on TalkSport actually understand and take on board the criticisms and the points that West Ham fans have. Every other TalkSport presenter, Simon Jordan, Jim White, um... Who was, was, was the other... Um, Andy Andy Goldstein, I think, has, has done it in the past as well. All of these pundits are just so firm in their belief that West Ham are as good as we're going to get. And if we get rid of David Moyes, that we're suddenly going to be fighting relegation again. Why is it that if Moyes goes, we're suddenly guaranteed relegation? I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand. Why is it so likely that's going to happen? And why is it so unlikely that actually things will be okay and maybe we will push on maybe we'll keep the equilibrium who knows but i don't think west ham fans should be ostracized and criticized and abused for wanting a better brand of football to watch when they pay their 70 quid a week to go to the game when they pay 15 quid for a burger and chips seven quid for a pint 50 quid on the train journey to get there if you're coming from a bit of a distance it's a 200 quid day out to me it is anyway it's a 200 quid day out for me and my dad to go and watch that uh, watch west ham game i haven't been up there for years it's too expensive i can't do it with the with the economy the way it is with the the financial crisis that we're currently in it is a big expense and it's testament to the number of fans up and down the country in all of the leagues that continue to go and watch their teams week in week out five thousand fans traveled to germany last night to watch that shit to watch west ham camp on the edge of their own box for 90 minutes they sung their heart out it's fair play to them but i think it's very as much as david moyes it's not completely on him to you know, take that into account. He, he shouldn't really be thinking about the fans and the money they've spent on games when he's looking at how he should play this game. I get that. There should be an element of it, I think, but it's not completely that. He has to do what's best for the team and against the opposition that's in front of him. I get it. But at the same time, when you're playing at home against Bournemouth, when you're playing at home against Burnley and you're giving up the ball and you're sat on the edge of your own box waiting for them to come on to you, to me, that's unforgivable. That's that, I'm sorry, that is. With the team that we've got, you that is so disrespectful to the fans and to your own players. What does it say about your own players when you say that when Burnley come to town, we're going to have to sit back? 
We can't we can't go at them. We think they're too dangerous. Burnley and Sheffield United are two of the worst teams to have graced the Premier League in recent years. They have been absolutely dire all season. I know they've had a little bit of a resurgence recently, a few better performances recently, but not more across more often than not across this season, they've been absolutely woeful. And West Ham have turned up and treated them like they are a better side than us in the way that we've approached. So yeah. Let's move on. Right, okay, that's that kind of rant over. Let's just quickly talk about the good things with David Moyes because I do feel like it's important to have some balance and some factual statements here because it's not all bad, okay? It, 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 we have to make sure that as West Ham fans, when we're criticising David Moyes, we have to acknowledge the good things that he has done. So, he came in twice when we were in big, big trouble, relegation-wise. The first time he didn't get the job permanently, the second time he did. And since then, he's, on, he's been on a fantastic run of results, okay? When you look at the results from a purely analytical point of view, from when you look at the wins against losses, he has been very, very good for us, okay? There is absolutely... It is completely and utterly undeniable to deny him the praise for the record that he has given us. We've been in Europe for three seasons in a row, and there's still a half sensible chance if we can put together a run between now and the end of the season that we'll be in Europe for a fourth successive season. I don't think it'll be because we win the Europa League, but we might sneak in maybe sixth or seventh in the league if we can put a run together. So it's not out of the question. I personally think we'll end up in the bottom half of the league the way we're playing currently, but um, it is still possible Okay, if things turn around a little bit. So definitely that is a positive. Um, he has given us some amazing nights. Leon away 3-0 the Seville game at home I think we won 2-0 or 2-1 I can't remember what it was the Freiburg game recently 5-0 some of those European nights and let's not forget the final of course some of those European nights will go down in Hammer's memories for a long time we are not a club that is used to playing European football on a regular basis so he deserves a humongous amount of credit for giving that to the West Ham fans um, and being part of that journey because it's been brilliant it's been the final I mean I, I, I'm not unfortunately a regular enough goer to to West Ham games that I was ever likely to get a ticket for the final and it would be too expensive and frankly I just can't afford it still going to the pub and going to watch that with all the other West Ham fans there the atmosphere in there was bouncing and it will be something I remember for a long time and look because I'm a West Ham fan and fans of clubs outside of the, the big boys who tend to win the trophies every year will know that you need to savour these trophies whether they're big trophies like Champions Leagues FA Cups whatever if they're even the lower tier level of the cups, it is still a big night for your club. And it is still a, a massive thing to remember. Um, and he gave us that. And I will remember that for a long time. And that could be the last trophy we win for the next 20 years. I have absolutely no idea. So we have to we have to thank him for that. We have to hold our hands up and say thanks to David Moyes for providing those moments. So yeah, those are the those are the key things. There have been some other things as well. We brought in some good players, although he hasn't always been the reason for those good players. He seems to have a pretty reasonable relationship with some of the players, but not all. And we'll get into that when we, excuse me, when we flip the script and talk about the bad stuff. Um, and unfortunately for me, the the that is where the good stuff kind of ends. But that is solely where the mainstream media and the social media focus their attention. They focus their attention on the results. They focus their attention on the league position, and they focus their attention on Europe. They never look at the other side of the argument here. They never look at what's going on behind the scenes and. For a station like TalkSport that is supposed to be the nation's biggest sports broadcaster, uh, certainly from a radio and, and, and uh, online presence point of view, I think it's it's really bad that they never open up a discussion and have a bit more of a um, an understanding discussion with, with anybody um, to understand why West Ham fans are upset. They just dismiss it out of hand. They're not interested in hearing the arguments. So let's go through the bad stuff, shall we? We've talked about the style of football. I don't need to cover that anymore. We've talked about why West Ham fans hate it. Um, he's spent half a billion pounds since he's been at West Ham. We've ended up with the smallest, one of the smallest squads in the Premier League in terms of senior players. And we've ended up with, I think it is the oldest squad in the league. In January, he let go Pablo Fornals and Saeed Benrahma, two players who were very good squad players, um, and brought in Calvin Phillips, which was... Confirmed by many places, many sources, that that was his signing. He was pushing for that and had been since last summer. I think maybe even before that. I think he was pushing for that when Man City signed him. And it's been disastrous. Um, I per personally believe that the way David Moyes has handled Calvin Phillips is partly to blame. I think he, he came with a lot of baggage from his time at Man City, which definitely didn't help. But I think the way that Moyes has used him has hung him out to dry in certain regards. 
And when you look at the squad itself and the fact that we've got a small squad, one of the reasons that we've got a small squad and players like Ben Rama and Four Nows were so open to leaving is because he doesn't use any subs. He doesn't use his squad. We had Divine uh, Mabama, who was on fire in pre-season, has barely had a look in all season. Uh, we've got one or two other youth players that haven't had barely any minutes all season. Danny Yings has got splinters in his arse all season. So has Max Cornet. And I'm not suggesting for one minute that these players are going to come in and suddenly set the world alight and improve the team. But you have to use them in a more intelligent way. You know, we've got, a, we've got a bench full of players now, unfortunately, that are not as good as the first 11, which is fine, which is why they're on the bench. But when I look at, if you want to make a comparison here and stay with me here, when you com let's compare West Ham to Liverpool for a second. And again, stay with me because you're probably already thinking this is ludicrous to compare the two. But I want you to look at the way that Jurgen Klopp uses his squad. I want you to look at the way and think about how Jurgen Klopp brings in these youngsters, untried, unproven youngsters at the top level. He brings them into the squad. Look at the way he puts his arm around those players. Look at the way they play when they come on, how much motivation, how much desire they have when they come on that pitch. Jurgen Klopp installs belief in those players. He makes them believe and he makes them confident that they can go out and be first team players and that they can come onto the pitch and help the team. David Moyes does not do that. He might put his arm around them before they come on the pitch, but actions speak louder than words. He brings them on so late in games that they can't have any impact. He never starts them. He never rotates the team. He never gives players a breather. And that's why when we end up when I mean, we've been very lucky this season with injuries. I mean, there's been some teams this season that have had absolutely horrific injury records. If West Ham had had anything like some of those injury records for some of our players, if Bowen or Pakatar had been injured for like one or two, two or three months, Kudus had been injured, we would genuinely be fucked because we have absolutely nothing behind them. And the players that come in would be so down on confidence, they'd be so down on morale, they'd be so lacking in match sharpness um, that they would be... You, you know, they'd be useless, certainly in the in the start before they can get a run of games together. And now I know there are very few managers in the league who can really make a squad rotation like that work. Klopp and Guardiola are two of those managers who can sort of rotate and almost not have any um if you if you exclude the, the obvious quality difference between the West Ham and those two teams, the fact that those players come in and there's almost no difference between how they play the style and the motivation, the effort, the attitude. There's none of that with West Ham players. And that is why players like Ben Rama, who has been a bit hit and miss for West Ham, and his quality does let him down at times. Um, that's why he wanted to leave, because he wasn't getting a look in. He wasn't getting used properly. Pablo Fornaus, I think, was a great squad player. He loved West Ham. He was basically uh, our new Mark Noble. Yeah, he, came, he had to leave. He didn't want to leave. He wanted to go because he was not getting played. We had Flynn Downs, who effectively was a long-term replacement for Mark Noble, who in the games that he played for us looked actually, I thought, pretty good. I thought that he deserved a much longer run in the team to really see what he could do. What does David Moyes do? Farms him off to Southampton. You know, we, we, there's players there. Brings in Haller and Skamaka. Doesn't have a clue how to use them. Refuses to change his system to suit the benefit, to suit the, uh, the attributes of those players. It just doesn't make any sense. So... That's 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 one one side of things. There's also been some problems in recent times where he is he's clashing with West Ham fans now as well. And I understand he may be frustrated because he thinks he's doing a good job. That's fine. But what you can't do is start lashing out. And he has been lashing out in recent times in press conferences, um, making sort of snide and cynical comments about things. But his his constant. Uh, decision-making processes when he's talking in, in press conferences about how actually he thought we played pretty well. He thought we were, he actually thinks we're an attacking team. He has said those words. He says that we are an attacking side. It just, it's, it's, you're butting heads with the West Ham fans and it's not a good look and it never ends well. If David Moyes was to suddenly change his ways and play a bit more of an attacking brand of football, there isn't a West Ham fan on this planet that would be against Moyes staying. All he would have to do is just play a little bit more like he does did against Freiburg, a little bit more like he did against Brentford. Allow us to be a little bit more... I'm not suggesting that he's going to suddenly change and become a Guardiola. That's obviously unrealistic to ask. But it is not unrealistic to ask to stop playing a low block against crap teams in this league. That is not an unrealistic request. We should be looking to dominate the ball more and be more creative on, with our creative players. Allow Pakatar more freedom. Allow him more time on the ball. Because when he is on the ball, he makes things happen. As shown by the statistic that Pakatar 
Uh, we have not won a Premier League game this season when Pakatar has not been playing. If Pakatar plays, we win games. If he doesn't, we, we don't win games. That is a factual piece of information. And it shows how important he is to this team because he gets on the board, he makes things happen. Even in a team that plays like we do, he can still make things happen. Imagine what he could do if he was given more touches on the ball, more possession. Imagine what Bowen and Kudas could do with more possession on the ball. These are really quality players that could walk into a top six team. I genuinely believe that any one of our front three, Pakatar, Kudas and Bowen, could go and play for a top top five, top four team. Genuinely, I believe that. I think Bowen could could you know get into one of those teams maybe not a man city just because of the depth of riches that they have but i think that bowen i think that pakatar and i think that kudas could all easily go and compete for a starting place at any one of those other top teams i genuinely think that so we're we are at risk of wasting a, a really good talent pool from an attacking point of view and pakatar may leave in the summer whatever but um, we've got Tim Stide and our director of football who can make things happen, but he needs to be given more control. He needs to be given more autonomy. And despite the re working relationship between him, Moyes and the board apparently being better than perhaps we thought, I still don't think it's as good as maybe they're making. I think they're trying to, I think that he's putting on a, a front, a brave face. I know he, I don't think he wants to antagonize things anymore. He doesn't want to create a media circus around the club. Um, so yeah. You look at the body language of the players during games. They're frustrated at times because they're not getting the ball. <sighs> I need to take a breath. You know, it's, it is frustrating because... I th do you know what? I think the frustration comes more from hearing other people's viewpoints on West Ham and how, how everything that I've just said will be overlooked probably because we are seventh in the league and we're West Ham. I think that's the most frustrating point about it. And I just want somebody in the mainstream media, I don't care who it is, I don't care whether it's Simon Jordan, Martin Keown, Danny Murphy, Jim White, Andy Goldstein, Darren Bent, I don't care who it is from TalkSport. I just want one of them to actually sit down and look at the stats, watch a couple of games to see what we're talking about, and then just have a, an ounce of, not sympathy, that's the wrong word, but understanding of where we are coming from and why we want difference. Um... And look, the proof will be in the pudding because I do generally think the Moyes will go and I do think that we're going to bring somebody else in. Arnie Slot from, I think, Feyenoord he's currently at is one that's heavily rumoured and heavily linked. Graham Potter's another one. Um, and look, it may get worse again before it gets better. But at the moment, um, and if <laughs> I, I, I shudder to think if it does get better before, sorry, it gets worse before it gets better. My God, the narrative around that is going to be incredible. It's going to be like, oh, we told you you shouldn't have got rid of David Moyes, etc., etc. Um and look, that's the risk that you take. But I don't think that it's an unfair request to want something more. I don't think it is an unfair request to want to build and I want and want to keep going. All the good teams in this league build upon things when things are going well. They don't stand still. They don't stagnate. And that's exactly what it feels like West Ham are doing right now. And we are papering over cracks with a couple of good results. If we get knocked out by Leverkusen next week, which... I mean, given the, the scoreline, it's going to be a very tall order for West Ham to overturn that, especially when we don't have Pakatar, Emerson, and probably not Bowen, because um, I don't think he's going to be fit. Well, I don't, we're not going to turn that over. I, I, I would be stunned if we do. So if we go out in the quarterfinals next week, and going out against Leverkusen is no... Uh, there's no shame in that, but there is shame in how, you, in how you go out and how you lose the game. If we then come bottom half of the league, right? If we, let's say, come 11th, which is absolutely possible if some of those other teams underneath us can put a few wins together because it's all very tight. If we come 11th, we get knocked out in the Europa League quarterfinals, what will the narrative be then? Because at the moment, everyone is using 7th place and 6th place like a stick to beat us with. If that stick goes away, what's the narrative going to be then? What's the narrative going to be when we finish in the bottom half of the table with a front three of Boeing, Kudus and Pakatar? Tell me then. Tell me what the narrative will be then. Will they still be saying that David Moyes is the right man for the job? Be interesting. Be interesting. Look, I've said a lot. There's probably some bits I haven't covered. There's probably a few bits that I wish I had said that I haven't. I've kind of gone off on a bit of a rant. Um, I really hope you guys take on board the points I've made. Um, and yes, of course, I am on the David Moyes out camp. I'm, I don't mind if you're on the David Moyes in camp. I just want you to be able to understand and justify the reasons why against or justify the reasons why in a, in a conversation, in an argument against the reasons that he shouldn't stay. I want you to explain to me and, you know, use 
good, uh, you know, good arguments, good reasons. Explain to me why David Moyes should stay based on just results alone against everything else that's going on behind the scenes. Because there is a big rebuild coming at West Ham this summer. We need a lot of players this summer. We really do. We are to say we need. We don't need a complete rebuild, but it's not far off. We need a lot of squad players. We've let a lot of players go recently and not replace them. Calvin, if, if they sign Calvin Phillips, I'll cry. Um, we've let Kerrer go. He's probably going to leave. Ben Rama's on loan. He'll probably go. Fournals has already gone. Mabama is, is out of contract. He's going to go. Ben Johnson's going to go. Antonio's 34. Fabianski's 39. Zuma's knees retired two years ago. Um, Ogbonna's 35, I think now. Aaron Creswell's 34, 35. These are all good squad players that do play a lot of games that are either getting very old and are, are sooner or later are going to have to drop away um, or are just going to outright leave. And, of course, then you've got Pakatar probably leaving. You know, th there's a lot of players to replace. and We've already got a small squad. So Moyes' reluctance to use the youth and invest in players, invest in those youth players and start giving them more games. If it were me, right, I would be seriously tempted to start blooding some of these youngsters now between now and the end of the season. I think there's enough, even though we're chasing Europe, and I understand why he wouldn't, and I wouldn't be against him not doing this, but I do think that now is a really good opportunity to start blooding a few of those youngsters because it would give them the opportunity to show why they can be, they can step up. They can step up into the places of the players that are leaving in the in the summer. Max Corne, Danny Ings, probably another two that may well look to move on for their own careers because they're just not getting played. So yeah, big, big rebuild in the summer. But yes, again, sorry, I'm circling here, but go... If you're going to tell me in the comments why David Moyes should say, don't just say because he's got you into Europe for, for three seasons in a row. Don't just say because he won your trophy. Don't just say because you're seventh in the league. Justify it with more than that. That is so surface level, it's embarrassing. Yeah? You've heard all the arguments here now. You've heard all the reasons why. Tell me why they those things don't matter. Okay? And then look, if somebody comes up with an amazing reason and I get an epiphany and go, actually, do you know what? You're right. I have no problem changing my mind if somebody gives me a valid reason to. And I think that is so important in today's society that we've lost the ability to have these conversations, to have arguments and and, and disagreements. We've lost the ability to debate. We, we've lost the ability to hear opposing points of views and not be open to, to, to changing our mind. I am open to having my mind change, people. I really am. I'm, I'm, I've been moise in and out off and on all season, so I've changed my mind already three or four times a season anyway. Um... So, yeah, don't be so closed off to one, the other point of view to what yours is. So, yeah, let me know in the comments down below. I appreciate you listening to me ranting and raving about this. Uh, I'm sorry if it's come across as a very one-sided argument, but I'm just a frustrated West Ham fan at the moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. I'd love to hear. The last time I did a West Ham video, it popped off and did really, really well. So let's see what this one does. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you listen to our podcast. We come out every Tuesday morning on all podcast platforms. We talk about all the stuff in the Premier League. Uh, me, Dan, Lee, Pete, and sometimes we get uh, Josh involved as well. Um, we, look, we like to have some in-depth chats. We like to have some fun. There's a fun quiz in there you guys can play along with. Um, it's really, really cool. I'm starting to do more TikTok shorts and YouTube shorts to get clips out there and stuff like that. We're trying to grow, so help us grow. If you love retro video games as well, we've got an LMA series, which is really, really popular for a China of our size anyway. So go and check that out. And of course, like, subscribe, comment, all those good things. And I'll see you all in the next video.